Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, <coughs> hope you are well and healthy, uh, wherever you are. Um, <coughs> we're going to talk about power supply loop design. And uh, this time, uh, I'm going to try and not use the transfer function at all and still get really nice phase margin, near really nice gain margin, and crossover frequency. Uh, so uh, there are several power supply design methodologies. Um, the method one, which is you drive or use a transfer function equation. Uh, you calculate the gain and phase, then you place the poles and zeros of the compensating frequency domain. And then for testing, you measure loops in frequency domain, the transient response in time domain, and so on. That's method one. Uh, then we have method two, which is um, exactly the same as method one, but uh, you don't measure the loop in the frequency domain instead you just give it a few steps and you look for ringing on the scope. Uh, we don't recommend you do it that way. Measuring the loop is always the best way to give you the most amount of information. And then there is method three, which is by far the most popular, and that is you copy an application node, then you mess around with it until uh, it starts working. Uh, and then for testing, you see if the output voltage is what you expect. If not, you mess with it a little bit more and then you put finger on it to see if it gets hot or not. All right, so these are the three main methods of, uh, of designing power supplies. Uh, and of course, method one is almost universally accepted to be the most uh, comprehensive and the best approach. Okay, but there are certain problems in method one in that it's actually really complicated, right? So first of all, you need to know a lot about control theory. Having been a, a university uh, faculty member for many, many years. I know that everybody absolutely hates control theory. Uh, so uh, learning that stuff uh, is hard. Uh, and then also in, at workplace in particular in industry, you don't have time to apply that kind of rigorous um, uh, analytical methods that you learn at university because you're always in a rush to put your product out of the door. Then if the transfer function is not publicly available, uh, then you have to derive it yourself, and that makes it even more complicated. So, you know, if you're designing a flyback or a buck, you can get on the internet and you can find out, uh, let's say, what the transfer function is. If you're doing some resonant converter or something that is not very common, then the chances are that the transfer function is not even available. And then you need to know even more control theory and switch model and modeling and that sort of thing in order to get the transfer function. Then <clears throat> a uh, big problem with this situation is that the model many times is not very accurate because of uncertainty. So you need to measure the parasitics, such as the ESR, the AC resistance, the losses across the switches. Then the model changes with operating conditions, with aging, with temperature, with input voltage, output current, and all sorts of stuff. So you kind of drift out of, of what is the, let's call it a mathematical elegance of a equation, and you come to real world, and the real world very often is not the same as the mathematical world that you have, right? Now, also, increasingly manufacturers are providing more and more features into their chips. And by doing so, um, they are adding certain, let's say, gains or certain, certain functions that impacts the uh, transfer function, but that is not provided in the data sheet, right? So many times you have the data sheet of the device and suddenly what you measure is not exactly what you expect because there is a gain in the, uh, in, in, let's say in a, in a current um, amplifier inside of the chip that is not either well documented or it is just hidden in a table that you haven't noticed, right? Often all the information for the, Frequency domain is not in the data sheet. So sometimes there's some small missing bits and you expect, let's say, when you measure the plant to have a certain gain and then you're off by usually a factor of one or a factor of two if they have just a tiny little current, sense ampl uh, current amplifier inside of the silicon. Uh, so then, again, your maths is off. Um, <clears throat> then... For passives, ESR, ESL, AC resistance, etc., is either not given at all, or if it's given, <clears throat> it's only given at a certain frequency. Um, so, in the case of the ESR, for example, you need to measure the ESR at the crossover frequency for loop stability, but often in the data sheet, it's given at um, the 100 kilohertz seems to be a magic number. 
However, a lot of manufacturers now provide tools, uh, simulation tools and so on, that uh, um, gives you a, a very nice web interface that you can actually work, um, uh, let's say, some of these parameters out. Um, then, <coughs> inductance falls greatly with current. Uh, ceramic caps have DC bias loss. So again, you have derived this beautiful mathematical model. You have got your Cs and you've got your Ls, but in reality, that is not exactly the same as the, the MATLAB model or the mathematical model that, that, that you have because your uh, inductance, uh, as the current goes up, your inductance has gone down or your ceramic caps are, are, are significantly less than what you expect because of the DC bias. Uh, if you have a digital power supply, um, every time you have a time delay, um, you um, change the transfer function, you lose phase margin, then there is an ADC gain, there's a DAC gain, and this completely messes up the model. So it makes it, again, difficult to try and place your poles and zeros and get the crossover frequency that you want or the phase margin you want because the plant is off just because of the uncertainties. Um, in current mode, for example, the magnetizer inductance of the current sense transformer, again, messes up the slope compensation. Uh, so th as you can see, there is lots and lots of things in the transfer function that in order for you to get a nice design, you have to measure everything and you have to delve in it in a lot of detail in order to uh, actually get the model accurate. As a result of the above and things that I've spoken about, uh, our model is not accurate. Uh, so to solve this problem, what do we do? We measure even more. So we measure as many parasitics as we can. We take the body 100, we measure the ESR and, uh, and so on. Then we place up compensated poles and zeros. Then we measure the loop again, uh, and then it won't fit with the simulation or what we expect. And then we start messing around with it in order to uh, um, uh, make it meet. Uh, if it's just a matter of gain, so if you're off by a factor of two, so if you, if you expect to cross at 10 kilohertz, but you're crossing at 20 kilohertz, then possibly you have missed the gain somewhere. Um, if not, if it's phase, you have to start the sniffing around and find out what it is that is the problem. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, but you have to take into account when these methods were invented. Uh, computers did not exist as we know it <laughs> at, at the time these methods were invented. Uh, when I learned uh, computing, I learned it on a Commodore PET, which had a um, green screen and the Space Invaders was the only game we could, we could play. So you can, by that, you can guess how old I am. Uh, so at those times, we did not have like extensive mathematical tools that we have at our fingertips, right? A real loop measurement was either extremely expensive or impossible, And but right now you can uh, pick up a Bode 100 at an extremely affordable price. I'm sure my, uh, my friends in Omicron think that it's a, it's, it's a wonderful deal. Uh, so the test, seriously, the, test, the price of test instruments for measuring loops has, has, has come down so much. Uh, then... Um, we still plotted Bode plots on paper graph paper. So again, when I was a student, uh, I had literally paper graph paper, and you had a logarithmic scale on one axis, and you had linear scale on 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 the on the y axis, and and because you plotted the gain in dBs, you effectively would get a logarithmic logarithmic paper. Now. Uh, I don't know uh, how many people still uh, plot uh, 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 graphs on a graph paper, but during the days when these methods were being invented on designing power supplies, this was the tools that they had. I'm not sure if anybody plots stuff on graph paper, mainly because I tried to buy some and I couldn't find any. <laughs> right? So I am guessing that there, there is not that much demand uh, for this. So then the question is, is there a better way that we, now that we have got all these fantastic tools, so instead of deriving a mathematical transfer function, then creating a model, then measuring all the parasitics, then tuning the model with the parasitics, then create the plant body plots, uh, then designing a compensator, then measuring the loop, and then after you've measured the loop, you start fixing things again. Why don't we just measure the plant and then just manually place the poles and zeros? We have the tools in, in terms of a very nice, cheap, uh, well, let's say, let's say, um, 
uh, uh, the test instruments these days. Uh, we have very cheap computers. Computers are extremely fast. Uh, and all you need to do is measure it. And then wouldn't it be nice if you could then have a graphical tool whereby as you place the poles and zeros, it automatically changed the shape of the body plot so that you could align it and, and, and fix it the way you want it to behave. And of course, we have added that feature to WDS. And we call that direct design method with plant measurement. So here's how we do step by step. Step one, you crudely stabilize and measure the plant frequency response using the body 100. And we talk about in detail a little bit later on uh, how we're going to do this, right? Usually you do this with a very simple polar origin, effectively just an op amp with a huge ceramic capacitor and the feedback path. And that will make the uh, power supply <clears throat> slow but stable so that it's regulating. After that, you can measure the plant. So step two, you import, after you've measured the plant, you import this data into breach of WDS. And for those of you who don't know, WDS is a um, very uh, extensive power supply design software from us. And we have added this feature and because of the COVID crisis, we have made it completely free of charge, at least for the next few months. Um, so you used to have to pay for it, or when you came to our workshops, you got a license for it. But because many of us are stuck at home, we have actually made a lot of tools and resources uh, available. Um, the link was at the beginning of the slide. I'll give you the link later as well. You just go there, you register, you download it. Uh, please pass it on to anybody else. There is no uh, hooks, there is no credit card, nothing. You just take it for free uh, and, and use it. And that this feature is now available in breach of WDS. So after you have measured the plant using your body 100, then you import this into Breacher WDS, right? Then step three, you select the generic topology feature of WDS. We call it generic because it doesn't matter whether it's a bu buck or a boost or a sepic or whatever, because all you're dealing with is you are inputting the plant body plot, and then manually, you're going to place poles and zeros. And as you place poles and zeros, WDS will plot the curve, and we do a demo of this, so that the total plant uh, loop uh, body plot fits your stability requirements. Then you measure the loop to make sure that everything is cool and everything is working, uh, and that's it. Now, there's advantages to this method. First of all, it's quick. You don't need an in-depth knowledge of control theory. Pretty much all you need to know is how to read the body plot. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. You need to know how to measure a plant. We're also going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and you need to know what poles and zeros do. So, you know, if your uh, gain is uh, going too sharp, how you make it shallow. Or if your phase is too low, how you give it a little bit of phase boost. And, <coughs> pardon me, by measuring the plant, um, then you don't have to work out the ESR, the ESL, the ACR, the parasitics, the tolerances, all of this, because your plant is really what you've got, right? There are, of course, in engineering, always compromises. There are some disadvantages. First of all, if you have coincident poles and zeros, so if a pole happens to be right on top of a, a zero, then you may miss it. It's hard to tell whether it exists or not. And right-hand plane zeros, for topologies that have right-hand plane zero, may be hard to spot. So you need a little bit of a trained eye to, uh, to spot a right-hand plane zero. But again, in this webinar, we're going to talk about how you, you detect, you, you, you find out whether you have a right-hand plane zero or not. So the tool that you need, in addition to your body 100, is going to be Breach WDS which, as I mentioned, is completely free at the moment, <clears throat> um, and allows you to design and stabilize power supplies. Um, for It has a bunch of power supplies with the transfer functions, and then it automatically place and places uh, poles and zeros. It's got very sophisticated algorithms that stabilize the control loop in both analog and digital domains. And the new version now <coughs> supports uh, a direct uh, design, uh, with plant measurement, and because of the COVID crisis, we have made it completely free. All you have to do is go to this website here, which is breacher.com forward slash 2020, a year that personally I really quite like to forget. So by 2021, we'll change this link, uh, and, uh, and, and you get all the resources from that link. 
This is how it looks like. Uh, I will do a demo uh, shortly. Uh, this is how it looks like in terms of uh, the, the interface. And <coughs> here is the um, topologies that you select. And there's a new, new entry here called generic. We're going to do a demo in a minute anyway. And then, of course, here you get all the body plots. And you can import the measurements from body 100 directly into WDS. So you've got access to this very sophisticated power supply design tool through uh, body 100. So <clears throat> I said we had four steps to go through in order to uh, get this method working. Uh, step one was to crudely stabilize the power supply. So how do you do that? You just have to make an extremely slow loop, right? So most controller ICs come with a um, an op amp internal. And instead of having a type 2 or a type 3 compensator, all you do is you stick a huge capacitance here, anything between 2 to 10 microfarads, and that will hopefully start to um, it will get you a very slow power supply, but it's stable. And as long as it's stable, then you can measure the plant. You will not leave it like this. You just need to measure the plant, and in order for that to happen, you need to get it regulated. Then step two for plant measurement. Uh, with your body 100, you can do that very easily. Here is your body 100. Here is the uh, injection transformer. Uh, hang on a second, I think I have one. <clears throat> So that is your um, injection transformer. Um, and you uh, place the probe there. That is channel one of body 100. So this is channel one over here, right? And that's channel one. And that is channel two of the body 100, which is connected to here. Injection transformer is connected to here. And then effectively what you're measuring is the uh, body plot from channel one to channel two. So you're measuring from there to there and there to there. And of course, this part is the power stage and this part is the PWM. So the two of them together is your overall plant plus the PWM gain. And, and what you have therefore here is the plant. Now, when you have measured that, you can import that into WDS, okay? So in order to import that to WDS, and I said I'll, uh, we will demo this later, uh, after you have installed WDS, you go to File, you import WDS as a body, body 3 file, right? And then on the drop-down menu, these are the uh, um, topologies that WDS designs with the mathematical transfer function. So we have added this uh, extra generic uh, entry whereby you can import this body 3 file straight into uh, WDS, okay? So then what you need to do is you need to manipulate the compensator poles and zeros. So when the plant, the measurement of the plant has gone into WDS, as you add poles and zeros, WDS will automatically change the shape of this overall loop as you add your poles and zeros. But in order to do that, we need to know what poles and zeros do and uh, how we go about uh, um, using them in order to get, meet the stability criteria, okay? So what is it that we are trying to achieve for a stable power supply? So it's the stability criteria. Now, when you're considering the open loop uh, frequency response, that's exactly what we do when we measure the loop with the body 100. Uh, at crossover frequency, um, the phase margin must be more than 45 degrees. That's step one. Please design for higher, design for 55 to 60. 45 is an absolute minimum uh, at the end of life, right? So please uh, try and get more phase margin than you can because of all, the, uh, all these uncertainties that, that we have, right? We know that crossover frequency is the frequency at which the gain plot hits the zero dB axis. Again, uh, in body 100, you can very easily find that with either a marker or you go into the gain box and you type in zero and it will immediately show you uh, um, um, where the crossover frequency is. The higher the crossover frequency, the faster the transient response in time domain, but the higher the risk of instability. Uh, also, 
the higher the crossover frequency, the more painful it is to pass the AMC test. It will because it will make it difficult to design the AMC filter. So please don't try to cross faster than you need to. Yeah. Uh, if you don't need to cross too fast, if your specification allows, try to cross lower. It will make life for yourself a lot easier, and it will make life for the RF guy who has to pass the AMC test also quite easy. Uh, easier also. Then the second thing is the phase margin. And the phase margin is the amount by which the phase plot is above min minus 180 degrees at crossover frequency. The lower the phase margin, the lower the oscillatory behavior at transients. So what happens is if you've got a very low phase margin, you give it a unit step and it rings. Uh, and of course, that means you're closer to instability. So step one then, for to meet the... Uh, um, the stability criteria is to, at crossover frequency, try to have a big phase margin of, let's say, 55 to 60 degrees. Step two is when the gain plot crosses over, you want it to be shallow and not sharp, right? So, so try, try to make it shallow. Uh, in an ideal world, around minus 20, I am... I begin to get uncomfortable if it's sharper than minus 26, 27 dB. So up to about 26 dBs, I probably will not do much about it. If it's more than that, then I try to look whether I can shift my poles and zeros a little bit in order to shallow this crossover. Then the gain margin should be at least 10 dBs. And gain margin is the amount by which the gain is lower than zero when the phase crosses at minus 180 degrees. Um, now, in analog power supplies, gain margin is usually not a big headache. In digital power supplies, when you have a lot of time delays and your phase erodes very fast, then gain margin is an issue. So for most analog power supplies, you don't have to worry too much about gain margin, but you certainly have to worry about the, the slope at crossover frequency and, of course, your phase margin. Okay? So in order to meet these three points, we are going to place our poles and zeros, yeah? And in order to do that, we typically have two major type of compensators. One of them is called a type two compensator, and the other one is called a type three compensator. So here, I've got a pole at origin. This is a type two, and it's used mainly for current mode power supplies, right? Not for voltage mode. For voltage mode power supplies, you need a type 3 because you need more phase boost. So if you look at the transfer function, I have got a pole at origin, I have got a zero, and I've got another pole. <clears throat> These are the equations for placing the poles and zero. So what you do is you say, you know what, I need a zero at one kilohertz. At that point, this becomes one kilohertz. Please note these are actually in rads per second, uh, not, in, not, in, not in hertz. But for simplicity, let's say, okay, the, the, you know that you need to place a zero at one kilohertz in order to stabilize something. And then you go and calculate the R's and C's. And then you go and solder them over here. And then the overall compensator transfer function plus the plant transfer function will give you a loop body plot that meets the stability criteria. Right? And again, in WDS, uh, actually WDS automatically selects the correct type for you, uh, but you can also manually select whether you want to type 2 or whether you want to type 3 or whether you want a normal op amp <coughs> or a transconductance op amp. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So then there's a, as I, as I mentioned, there was a normal op amp and there's the transconductance op amp. Uh, so again, WDS allows you to select between normal op-amp or transconductance, and transconductance op-amp basically has got a current source on the output. So instead of the um, compensation components being fed back to the inverting pin here, they are actually tied to ground. If you compare this diagram with the one from the previous slide, you will immediately see a difference between a normal op-amp and a transconductance op-amp. So I'm going to go back one page. There you go. <clears throat> this is the compensator components for a standard voltage amplifier. If I cut this point here, if I had a current source here, so the current had to go to ground to create a voltage across a component, you'd cut here, and then you tie this point down to ground, you get this. 
You see, it's exactly the same. When you look at application nodes or, or circuits, it is so easy to work out whether your, your chip has got a transconductance op-amp or has got a, a standard voltage op-amp by just looking at whether the uh, compensation components are being tied to the inverting pin or to ground. It's being tied to ground, so I immediately know that it's a transconductance op-amp. These two equations stays the same, so the position of the zero stays the same, and the position of the pole stays the same, but the position of the pole at origin depends on R1, which is here, RB, which is here, C1, and C3, and this transconductance gain right, the gain factor, and this is specified in the data sheet. But again, this is one of those parameters that changes a lot uh, from the data sheet. So, so in particular, when you have uh, controllers with transconductance up on them, many times you don't meet the gain that you expect to get, okay? But WDS also does that, uh, use, allows you to design with that. And then <coughs> a type three is similar to type two, but instead you have got now two zeros and two poles. And of course, if you have two zeros, you can give yourself 180 degrees of phase boost. Uh, and um, that is useful for um, voltage mode power supplies when you have a lot of uh, phase loss. Again, you place your poles and zeros, and after you have placed your poles and zeros, you, cl you calculate the uh, position of uh, the, the value of the component. And again, in WDS, all you do is you drop down this box, and after you've dropped down this box, you um, <coughs> um, WDS will calculate everything else for you. So, how do we know where to place our poles and zeros? What is the impact of a pole? What is the impact of a zero on the compensator? Well, every real left-hand pole uh, gives you 20 dB per decade gain fall and 90 degrees of phase lag, right? Normally, we don't call it a real left-hand plane pole because it's too much of a mouthful. When you say just a pole, we normally just mean, especially when you're dealing with a compensator, we normally just mean this type, right? You can't have a right-hand plane pole because if you have one, the system will be unstable anyway. Okay. Now, every real left-hand plane zero gives you 20 dB per decade gain rise and 90 degrees of phase lead. Now, that's a good thing because when, you have, when your phase margin gets low, you can use a, um, a zero in your compensator to, 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 to increase your phase margin. Okay? Again, we just don't call it a real left-hand plane zero. We just usually call it a zero uh, um, because... That's the one that is used on the compensator. Now, um, somebody asked a great question about right-hand plane zeros. Now, some plants, not compensators, some power supplies have a right-hand plane zero. And we're going to discuss this with examples of which ones do have it, right? And the problem with those is that uh, if you have a right-hand plane zero, you get a 20 dB per decade gain rise, but you get 90 degrees of phase lag. So suddenly what happens is that you get a lot lower phase margin than you expect because of this plant having the right-hand plane zero. And the best way around it is if you spot it. If you spot, you look on the body plot, and if you spot that the gain is going up, but the phase is going down, that is a right-hand plane zero, and you want to make sure that the crossover frequency is well to the left of a right-hand plane zero. So if you spot that you have got a right-hand plane zero at 70 kilohertz, for example, then what you need to do is uh, 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 try and cross at 7 kilohertz, okay? Now, then <clears throat> a double pole gives you 40 dB uh, per decade gate fall, gain fall and 180 degrees of phase lag, right? And that happens in most voltage mode power supplies, whereby because there are actually complex conjugate pairs, you get a little bit of a bump. You get on the, on the body plot, you see a little bit of a bump, right? Now, the double poles on the analog compensator on the op amp is real. So if you, if you design two poles on the same point, you will not get the bump because you're creating them with just capacitors and resistors and not with inductors. But in a plant of your power supply, because you've got an inductor and a capacitor, you get resonance, okay? 
But you still cannot have left-hand plane poles, right? If you have left-hand plane poles anywhere, it will mess things up, okay? You don't have to worry about double complex conjugate uh, zeros in analog power supplies because, uh, to the best of my knowledge at least, it's not possible to create them with uh, uh, a standard op-amp, but in, in, in digital power supplies you can, and there is lots of research going on on how you can use double complex conjugate uh, zeros, um, uh, but that's a different topic and only for digital power supplies, right? And we normally don't have to worry about right-hand plane zeros in discontinuous mode power supplies. So if you're designing a discontinuous mode flyback, you don't need to worry about normally. You don't need to worry about uh, right-hand plane zeros, but if you're doing a continuous conduction mode flyback, then you do. So armed with these few points, we now know what poles and zeros do, and the pole we place, the poles and zeros are compensator, so that we force the plant to meet the stability criteria. So there we go. That's a uh, example of a voltage mode power supply. Here, the blue trace. The blue trace is my plant, <clears throat> and the green trace is the loop after I have placed the poles and zeros. Right now. Let us see what we can spot on the plant. You can see that the gradient of this plant is shallowing out, right? And the blue trace, right? You can also see that the phase is going up. Now, if the phase is going up and the, and the gain is shallowing out, then you have a zero. And this is typically the ESR zero of the plant. And you cancel that almost always. You cancel that with a pole of the compensator. So you can tell from the blue trace that around 10 kilohertz, there is a zero. So then you go and place a pole at 10 kilohertz and the pole cancels a zero and this line becomes flat and it doesn't shallow out, yeah? Then, step two. A bump in the plant means you have got a double complex conjugate pairs of poles. There you go, here's your bump, right? And 180 degrees of phase loss. You can clearly see it. It's going from zero, whack down to near 180 degrees. The only reason it's coming up was because you have got an uh, ESR zero here, right? So, and that's a bit of a nightmare for a voltage mode power supply because you suddenly lose 180 degrees of phase loss, uh, of phase, and that's not a good thing. Okay, so we have double complex conjugate pairs of poles. How do we get rid of the impact of this? we take our compensator and we put two zeros right here. Okay, so if I put two zeros, I will negate the impact of this double pair, the, this complex conjugate pairs of poles. So, the plant has a flat line at low frequencies, and usually we would like high gain at low frequencies. A high gain at low frequencies means you have got an integrator. For those of you who have designed PI or PID compensators, this high gain is the integral term of your PI controller or a PID controller or what we call a pole at origin. That's a good thing. You're trying to get a high gain at low frequencies because that gets rid of the steady state offset right, the steady state error, and it allows the power supply to recover back and get back to the original uh, output voltage. In order to do that, we place our pole at origin, and as you place the pole at origin, it shifts it up. And the higher you make it, the higher the crossover frequency, the higher it shifts up, yeah? And the lower you make it, the lower the crossover frequency. So then by playing with the pole at origin, you can decide where the crossover frequency is. Okay, so another thing, you move one zero to the left if you need more phase margin or if the slope is too sharp at crossover frequency. So if you remember, I said that we want a shallow slope and we want a phase margin. Now, we know that a zero gives you a phase boost, so it pulls up this phase. Now, of course, if I place my zero more to the left, this going up feature appears earlier, and therefore, if you don't have enough phase, you just push the zero a little bit to the left, yeah? Okay, <clears throat> now, you move the pole at origin to the left or to the right, as I said, mentioned earlier on, to adjust the crossover frequency. 
So you can see with these five steps, we can now place our poles on zeros in order to shape that we start with a blue trace. After we have placed the poles on zeros, we shape it into the green trace. That's the loop which you can measure with the Bode 100. And you basically shape it and you shift it up and down until it's crossing at the right place and you have got the right phase margin. Step six, you do it again. <laughs> Make sure that it is giving you the results that you expect. Okay, so that was a voltage mode power supply. You can usually tell a voltage mode power supply by the presence of this bump, right? Be aware though, this is a simulation. On a real one, the bump is a lot flatter because of the AC resistance of the inductor. But if you look hard enough, you will see the bump in most voltage mode power supplies. If you don't see a bump at all around here, then, so it looks like a low pass filter. You see, look at the blue trace, that's my plant. Then it's a current mode power supply. Instead, at half the switching frequency, you can see a little bit of a bump, and that's why you need a slope compensation. So, just like the voltage mode, we have got an ESR. That's the equivalent series resistance zero of the plant, and you cancel that with a pole. Just like the voltage mode, we add a pole at origin in order to get this flat line here into a slope line here to give us that integral action to get rid of the uh, steady state error. Then, exactly the same as voltage mode, but there is no bump, and therefore there is no 180 degrees of phase loss. And that's why we don't need a type three compensator, which had two zeros. We only need a type two because we don't need as much phase boost, right? Again, you move the zero to the left if you need phase margin, more phase margin, or if the slope is too sharp, and you shift the polar origin left or right in order to shift the whole green trace that you see up and down until the crossover frequency is achieved, okay? And then you again, do it again. Then, dealing with the right-hand plane zero. Now, this is usually a little bit hard to spot on the body plot. What you need to look for is uh, the position whereby on your plant, so on the blue trace, the gain is going up, but the phase is collapsing. Can you see that, right? The gain is going up, but the phase is going down. This is not a normal zero, right? And of course, the problem with this is that you are losing a lot of phase and, and it will deteriorate your phase margin. The best thing you can do is try to cross over as far to the left as your specification allows you to make sure that this is not a dominant zero at the crossover frequency. So you lower your crossover frequency. Okay, there we go. Here you can see that the gain is rising, but the phase is falling, and that is a right-hand plane zero. So which topologies have a right-hand plane zero? If you operate in this continuous conduction mode, you don't normally have to worry about the right-hand plane zero. Right-hand plane zero only becomes a problem in the continuous conduction mode. Now, if you're looking from input to output, if the diode is before the choke, then there is no right-hand plane zero. If the diode is after the choke or after the inductor, then there is a right-hand plane zero, right? So this is a forward, or it would be the same as a buck, right? The diode is before this output choke, right? There is no right-hand plane zero. This one is a flyback. The diode is after the coupled inductor, right? Therefore, this one does have a right-hand plane zero, and you have to be more careful with it when you use this method in order to look for it and find out where it is. So, quick question. This is a boost converter. Does it have a right-hand plane zero or not? Okay, very easy. This is the choke. That's a diode. The diode is after the choke. Therefore, the boost converter does have a right-hand plane zero, and if you measure its plant, you look for where the gain is going up, but the phase is coming down, and then you cross much, much, much lower to make sure that everything works fine. So <clears throat> we are going to do a uh, live demo uh, in a minute. Uh, at first thing, I'm going to do a nice, easy one. It's a voltage mode. But... Okay, so I am going to... Uh escape this, and then I am going to go to WDS. Yeah, by the way, guys, we're not sure if these are going to happen, right? <laughs> For obvious reasons. 
Uh, these are the workshops that we were planning on running, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the June one for sure will not happen, right? So we will see. Uh, okay, you can download this, and I give you the link completely free. Uh, and um, first thing I do is I'm going to go and import a measurement which I have made with Bodhi 100, right? So there we go. This is, uh, let me go to the right place. I expected it to go automatically to the right place, but it did not. Um, workshop material, Omicron, Omicron webinar. Okay, voltage mode buck plant. I have measured this with a Bodhi 100. Uh, WDS allows you to import a Bodhi 3 file, so I just import that. Now you can see the black trace, yes? So that is my plant gain, and that is my plant phase. Let me get rid of this 180 degrees so they're the right place. Okay, <clears throat> remember I told you that on a real plant, this bump does not appear as big. That's because of the AC resistance. You can see that you can, can barely see this bump, right? Uh, because of the AC resistance of the, of the choke. Now, what I need to do is, <clears throat> at the moment, WDS thinks that the plant is this blue line here right? I am now going to import this measurement, right, into this blue line, right? And in order to do that, you go to here. I've measured, oh yeah, you change to generic. That allows you to import this, yeah? Now, it has now imported this measurement instead of the blue trace. The blue trace has disappeared, and if I actually turn off the measurement, you see that WDS is now assuming that your plant is this blue line, which is what I measured with my body 100, okay? What I need to do now is apply what we talked about in order to force this blue line to look like something that will pass my stability criteria. Right now, it is telling me that I've, I've got 20 degrees, sorry, 20 kilohertz of crossover, I've got a minus phase margin, so it's unstable, 27 dBs a gain margin, and 50 dBs per decade of slope. This is definitely unstable as it is, this, this green line. So now I am going to go and place my poles and zeros, right? So I go to my controller design, and I start placing poles and zeros. Now, first of all, you can see here that the gain is going up, right? So a bigger part of the phase is going up. Right? And you can also see, uh, it's a buck converter, so we know that it does not have a right-hand plane zero, but if you actually look very carefully, this will actually shallow down. It's very hard to see at the moment, right? But this is going up, so I have a zero around 10 kilohertz. What do I use from my compensator in order to cancel this zero? I use a pole. I have got a type three compensator because like we said in the slides, it's a voltage mode, yeah? and I have two poles. This is the transfer function of a type three. I've got these two poles. So first thing that I do is I cancel this zero. I have a zero at 10 kilohertz. I place a pole at 10 kilohertz, right? You can immediately see that this is completely flattened out, right? Okay, then I know that there is a double pole at around one and a half kilohertz right? Because it's a buck converter and you can barely see it on this one. There is too much damping, right? But it's around one and a half kilohertz. So what, how do we cancel two poles in the plant? We cancel them with two zeros. My compensator has got two zeros right here. What I do is I, I it's around one and a half kilohertz, 1,500, another one at 1,500. Okay, so what is it now? We are now crossing at 84 kilohertz, which is ridiculously high, right? So I'm going to, let's for now, just cross at 100, right? Sorry, place a pole at uh, origin at 100, yeah? And now you can see that you're crossing at one and a half kilohertz. You've got 100 degrees of phase margin, a lot of uh, gain margin, but the slope, and the slope is very, very, very shallow. That's because I'm crossing so low because my pole at origin is very low, right? I will increase that in a minute. Now, I have now used the two zeros. I have used one of the poles. So I used these two to cancel the double pole of my plant. I used uh, this pole to cancel the ESR zero. I've got another pole here, and a good place to place that 
is at half the switching frequency, right? Uh, because it will give you some uh, um, noise rejection uh, and it is not too close to the crossover frequency so that it does not mess up your phase margin. For this power supply, let's for simplicity say that the switching frequency is 200 kilohertz. Therefore, you place that last one in 100 kilohertz, okay? Now, the last thing I need to do is change this polar origin. And if you remember, I said that the polar origin shifts the whole thing up and down until I get good crossover frequency, good phase margin, and good gain margin and good slope. And again, everything is shown here. Crossover frequency, phase margin, gain margin, and slope. So let's do 500. If I place my Polar origin at 500, then I'm crossing at 5 kilohertz. I have got 73 degrees of phase margin, 44 dBs of gain margin, and 26 dBs of slope. The slope is a little bit sharp, right? But to be honest with you, I'll probably be quite all right with this one. So there are two ways of fixing this. Let's see if we can play with this a little bit. Okay, there we go. If I go high a little bit to 600, now I'm crossing at almost 6 kilohertz. I've got 70 degrees of phase margin, good gain margin, and slope is 25. What if I go to 700? Yep, yeah, 6, almost 7 kilohertz, 75 degrees. We're done. Yeah, it's working. Now, what I need to do, I can lower this a little. Maybe if I lower this a little bit, let's see if I lower this, it gets a little bit better. There we go, right? So I lowered one of my zeros to the left. And if when I lowered it to the left, I got 20 dB crossover. This bit here is a little bit low. So can I higher this a little? 800. You're crossing at 10 kilohertz. To me, this is really good. I don't like the fact that this part is too low. So let's see, we can fix that. 1,400. 500. 10,800. Let's see what we can do. 500. There we go. So now the last thing I need to do is select my component values. Now I can add a here, this voltage reference comes from uh, a um, the chip. So you, the chip that you have will tell you um, uh, whether it's two and a half volts reference and so on. For simplicity, let's say it's two and a half volts, right? You decide on the current that you want to go through here. Now, one milliamp. I typically try not to go below 100 microamps because a current below 100 microamps gives you a headache when you come to pass the radiated susceptibility test in the EMC. So one milliamp, WDS has calculated all of the component values for you here, right? Note that you're not given the option for a transconductance amplifier because you cannot do one really, a practical one with a type three compensator. Transconductance amp is only for type two, right? In the majority of the cases, so you don't have the choice. When we do the SEPIC, you can see that you can do it with a transconductance amplifier. So. I think our design is complete, right? So we've got the component values, right? And we have got the nice frequency response. Good crossover frequency, good phase margin, good gain margin, and a good slope. Design is complete without any mathematics whatsoever. Yeah. So that was the buck. So, so then, the, that, was a, that was just to show you um, a simple uh, buck converter and the impact of poles, zeros, how you place them, and how you negate different impacts, right? Um, so now, let us do a SEPIC. Let's see what I have on my... Yeah, the next one is a SEPIC. Uh, so I go back to my WDS. Uh, where is my WDS? Now, if you press this red button here, it clears everything. So it gets rid of everything that we've done. So I clear that. It says, are you sure you want to wipe all your hard work? We say yes. So that disappears off. Yeah. And now we're going to do a SEPIC. Uh, and I have saved one in advance. Um, where is it? Let me open one. There we go. That's a SEPIC. And this one, I have used an operational transconductance amplifier. So let me open that. 
No? Okay, so let me have a look at the measurement. Okay, this is the um, plant. I am going to import that, right? See? Okay, that's the loop. That's the plant. That's the compensator. So there we go. Here's my plant that I measured with the body 100. Right, let, let me get rid of that. There we go. This is a direct measurement of the plant. It's a sepic converter. The uh, transfer function of a sepic converter is complex, but I don't care. I don't even care what type of uh, compensator it is. All I need is to stick that into the blue trace, right? And after I've stuck it in the blue trace, I'm going to manipulate the poles and zeros like we discussed in order to get the right... Um, um, stability criteria. So there we go. That's the original blue trace, right? So, and there we go. It's into WDS. So now WDS thinks that this is your plant, yeah? And again, I'm going to try and get the stability criteria. So if I look at the loop, which is my... Um, <laughs> it's already stable. Uh, if you, the, the loop, which is the green trace, you can see, right, that um, I need to sh place my poles and zeros. I go to my controller design. Ah, I know why it's stable, because I've already done it once. So, so let's go to defaults. Okay, so this will be the default, right? Now, you can see that you've only got 12, 12 degrees of phase margin, yeah? Again, first thing, let's find where the ESR zero is. You can see from the blue trace that the phase is starting to go up around here, and you can see that the gain, can you see that the gain is going down, but then it flattens around here, right? So around 10 kilohertz, I have got an ESR zero. What do I cancel the ESR zero with? With a pole. I have got a type two compensator, right? And please note that this time I am using a transconductance amplifier, right? And I know that I've got a, my plant, the blue trace has got a ESR zero, how do I cancel it with a pole? Where is it? At 10 kilohertz. So let's place a pole at 10 kilohertz. Please look at the green line, which is my overall plant, right? Before and after I add, I cancel that zero. So this is before, right? You can see here that it's going down, but then it shallows in the slope. Yeah, right here. It's hard to see, but if, you, if you've got a trained eye, you can spot it. It's going down and then it shallows out. And that means that there is a zero, right? Now, I'm going to make that 10 kilohertz, and you immediately see that this becomes, this green line just becomes flat because I've canceled that zero. Have a look at that. I'm just going to add it now. It's just a straight line, right? Because I've canceled it. So right now, I have got a phase margin of 7 degrees, which is not that great, but I am crossing quite high. Also, so, so I've placed the, Beg your pardon, I've placed a pole to cancel the zero, yeah? Now, if I try and get more phase margin, what I can do is I can lower my crossover frequency. Let's start with a very low number, 100, right? And at the moment, I've got 100 here. I've still got low phase margin. This zero is unused, and I know that a zero gives me a phase boost, right? So I've got a low phase margin. At the moment, it's at 50 kilohertz, so it's not doing anything. So if I push my zero to the left, hopefully it's going to boost my phase, and I'm going to get more phase margin. So, so let's place that at 500 hertz, and there we go. We have got two kilohertz crossover, 75 degrees of phase margin, lots of gain margin, and a slope less than 26, right? Can I do a little bit better? Of course I could. I need to change it a little bit and play around with it, but this already is stable enough, right? Okay, the slope is a little bit too high. I could possibly push the zero a little bit to the left. Um, I can push this also a little bit to the left. Let's see what I can do. What happens if I go to 400? The slope gets better. Can you see that? So with the slope of 400, I'm crossing at 2.5 kilohertz, I've got 80 degrees of phase margin, 30 dBs of gain margin, and a slope of 21. Stable. 
a sepik with no mats, no graph paper. It's just done, right? With just a body 100 making the measurement and then you intelligently placing your poles and zeros, yeah? And then all I have to do is go to here. Again, the voltage reference is decided by the chip. You type in the chip, you, you type this value from the data sheet. It's calculated the component values for your, for your um, compensator. Note that for a transconductance amplifier, you need to specify the transconductance gain, yeah? That hopefully is there from the data sheet, yeah? And then we're done. So that is a SEPIC um, designed. Okay, so I go back to PowerPoint. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I didn't show you this. So after that, we actually made it. And you see the black trace? That's the real measurement now with the body 100. So green trace is what WDS, we designed with WDS. And the, the black trace now is the real measurement body 100. And we've got almost a beautiful, perfect fit. Because we didn't use mathematics, we didn't have uncertainty, we measured the plant. And then we added the, um, the poles and zeros. So we expect it to fit. Okay, so uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, WDS is now completely free. No hooks, no credit cards, nothing. Uh, because of COVID, we're making it free for everybody. Please forward to other people who may, you may think they are interested or stuck at home like some of us. Uh, you go to www.breacher.com slash 2020, it's uh, WDS is there, PLD is there for free, which is a power, power factor correction tool. There's a whole bunch of uh, very nice um, application notes and so on. Hope you enjoy the show and thank you very much for listening.